Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our um, last webinar of 2018. Uh, we're very excited to have uh, so many people uh, joining us. And today we have a very special topic looking at narrative um, of journalism and specifically with the specific case study of the impeachment of Dilma Youssef in Brazil. So for that, uh, we have a special guest speaker today from Brazil, Elira Santana. Um, yeah. And uh, I'm gonna hand it to you to uh, share with us um, your um, presentation. So we're gonna have a 40 minute presentation and then we can have questions and a discussion. Okay, okay. hello everybody. Oh, I'm Eliar from Brazil. I am journalist and postdoctoral student at PUC Minas. Um, I can share with you some aspects of my research and I apologize because I don't speak English fluently, okay? But I... All right, can we start? Okay. Can you see? No, you, no, what? it's not sharing. So on the green button, the share. Yeah, yeah. And this, oh, okay. I think it's, this is the problem. Now it's okay? No. No? No. Now. Oh my God. So remember that you, when it, uh, when you ask to share, it will um, ask you to identify which, which uh, file do you want to open. And so you're going to be then choosing yeah. your slides. Here. Okay. Oh. Okay, sorry. Here we yeah. go. Yes. Ah, it's okay. <laughs> bravo, bravo. Yeah, 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 yeah. One moment, please. And while while she's getting started, just want to welcome everybody. I see Frank Romanelli, Pam Steger, George, Christiane. Uh, I see um, Vera. Uh, I see Gilmar. We are just delighted to have you join us. And we're looking forward to your thoughts and feedback after we hear Elia. Eliara's presentation. So take it away, Eliara. Okay, let's go. So I, I, we are discussing about journalistic narratives, okay, and the construction of social reality. Oh, I think it's, uh, oh, what's going on with that? Sorry, I don't know what's going on. One moment. Oh, yeah, yesterday it was like this. That's always working on the practice and then. Uh, but we can we can do it like this. That works. You know, we see the we see the slides. Yeah, it's fine. Don't worry about it. That's excellent. We don't mind it. Go ahead. No, but. How can I? It's fine. No, no, but I have a here. Okay. Yeah. Oh, no, it's okay. So, okay. according to this proposal, okay, it's okay now. Yes, now it's working. Yeah. Perfectly. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, according to this proposal, my main research goal is investigating how discursive strategies were used for this construction. And considering yeah. Brazilian media, my main question is how did discursive strategies work for this construction? Uh, and to this research, I will work with daily editions 
of nationwide night news from Global TV Network. Uh, Brazilian media, a powerful information machine. Um, you can see only six groups in Brazil control everything spectators are watching, reading, and listening to. And according to Media Ownership Monitor, an NGO that had extensive media research, Brazil presents the most worrying scenery in terms of risks to pluralism. Media monopoly is a reality in Brazil, which poses many threats to our democracy. The most powerful media group in Brazil is Global Network, which has many vehicles, as you can see now. Global. Oh, in this diagram, you can see the structure of global corporation. Um, the corporation holds the 19th position among the most important communication groups in the world's ranking. And global is widely present in Brazilian homes with global TV, global news, global sat cable TV with 33 channels and newspapers, global, extra, valor, Epoca magazine, global agency, global radio, CBN radio, Global.com, Global Records, Global Press, and many others. And as you can see, it's a big corporation. Okay, oh, moving on. So my theoretical framework, some aspects. Three main aspects for my research. First, ideology. I will discuss bias, representation, stereotypes, values, and the press as an ideological apparatus. Power. I will discuss the nature of power relations in the mass media discourse and power as a co-driver of discourse. And consensus opinion. I consider that producing consensus arises from the production of a common enemy and the super dramatization of information bias public opinion. These three aspects operate in an information network which produces an information discourse. And in this information discourse, the nature of power relations is not clear. And Possible reasons are language is not transparent, media operates as a medium of expressing and propagating power, power effects of media are cumulative, and behind this aspect, each narrative standard is used by Brazilian media. How is this narrative structured? What kinds of discourse strategies are used? Is all right? Okay. Hello? Yeah, sounds good. Keep going. Ah, okay, 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 sorry. <laughs> Moving on. So, uh, to answer those questions, I rely on the perspective of news as a discourse. And what does it mean? We can outnumber some aspects. The context determines the structure of news. Some discursive strategies are used to produce many effects. Many values are carried by news. News are not an image of reality. Social world is routinely constructed by news. Some events and a factual network create an illusion of credibility. The illusion of credibility legitimizes the status quo and news reconstruct social events. So now about the information discourse, the information network, sorry. Um, how does ideology build and consolidate a stable information network, uh, specifically in Brazilian media? Uh, there are some very important points concerning this aspect. First, 
one world view is transmitted as the only truth. Oh my God, what's going on here? Sorry, but I don't know what's going on. Sorry, sorry. This. Oh, my. Journalistic narratives are consolidated by information discourse. There are repertoires and ideology can establish the link between language and power. And the process of constructing social realities based on three aspects, as we can see. Corruption, economic crisis, and common enemy. So about repertoires, um, corruption and economic crisis are the repertoires that shape the news by Brazilian media throughout President Dilma Rousseff's impeachment process. The impact of these repertoires in the news was devastating because they consolidated the perspective that the country was taken by corruption caused by the Workers' Party. So, in my research, I divided this period in seven discursive moments as follows. These discursive moments. Uh, discursive moment one. Uh, discursive moment two. Three. Discursive moment four. Can you see yeah. all of these? Okay. Um, so you identified um, these discursive moments by the major events in the process of uh, 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 impeachment. Yeah, yeah. I can I can explain uh, what are those discursive moments uh, because they are social and historical moments from 2013 until 2018, in which there are different media narrative standards. Media works with different strategies that function according to these specific contexts. Okay, and... Um, there are important elements present in all these discursive moments, uh, dramatization, emotional news, silencing, and emphasis on negative aspects. Uh, such cases, such discursive moments, help us to understand how journalistic narratives were constructed. Okay? And now you'll see a report from CNN about Dilma Rousseff's impeachment. It's a, a it's good South video. It's South America's biggest economy. It's the continent's most powerful country, one that thought it was rid of a history of violent military coups. But now, Brazil's democratically elected president, Dilma Rousseff, says she's the victim of a political coup after Congress Sunday night voted overwhelmingly to send impeachment proceedings against her to the Senate. Dilma's supporters reacted to the vote with shock and sadness, while her enemies and anti-government protesters celebrated. But what has she done? Presided over the worst recession in nearly a century, allegedly used creative accounting to conceal the hole in her budget, tried to hire her predecessor, perhaps to shield him from criminal investigation. But are these impeachable offenses? She herself has not been tainted by or even accused of corruption, and she refuses to resign. 
que pedem a minha renúncia Those who call me to resign Mostram show the fragility of their conviction of the process of impeachment because above all they are trying to instate a coup d'etat against our democracy I can assure you that I will not cooperate with this I will not resign for any reason whatsoever So it is at the core of this political drama that's led to anger and frustration online and on the streets you're not surprised when investigative reporter Glenn Greenwald lives in Brazil and he's closely covering this constitutional crisis. He joined me from Rio. Welcome back to the program, Glenn. It's great to be with you. So were you surprised? Did, did, did anybody really think that at the last moment she could have got the votes she needed to stave off this sort of impeachment process? I don't think the outcome was particularly surprising. I think that the margin was was fairly surprising, although Brazilian politics, like in a lot of other countries, is, is about momentum and power. And once there was a perception that they had the votes, a lot of last minute undecided which to the pro impeachment side um, so that they can be on the winning side. I think what did surprise people, though, was the tenor of uh, the proceedings in the house. It was extremely raucous, very ugly. You had pro-impeachment uh, advocates standing up and hailing the 1964 coup and the right-wing military dictatorship that followed. One prominent right-wing uh, congressman who's expected to run for president specifically praised the chief torturer of the military regime, who, of course, tortured Dilma Rousseff, the president, before then voting to impeach her. So it kind of was a, a very polarized and, and a very... Um, ugly tenor uh, to these proceedings that reflect this wider sentiment in Brazil that really has split the country in, in a very dangerous and unstable way. Even the, the vice president who may have to step in is himself of all sorts of misconduct and wrong, wrongdoing. And I just want to read this to you because it is extraordinary. Of the 594 Congress members, 352 face accusations criminal wrongdoing according to multiple reports and then of course there are all sorts of people including uh including eduardo cunha who's leading the impeachment process who's accused of perjury and corruption you've got another one maluf who's on interpol's red list for conspiracy you've got another one accused of money laundering you've got another one as you just mentioned you know who who is sort of implicated in all sorts of torture, and others, you know, implicated in human rights violations. Now, Dilma herself has called this a coup. What is going on? It's the most extraordinary thing, Christian, because not only is essentially the entire Brazilian political class that is trying to impeach her implicated in really serious I mean, the most surreal thing I have ever seen in my time as a journalist or anywhere else covering politics in countries was that yesterday, the person presiding over the impeachment proceeding in the House, the Speaker of the House, Eduardo Cunha, whom you referenced, he is somebody who was found to have stashed away billions of dollars in bribes. There's no non-corrupt possibility. He has no wealth. He has no businesses. Millions of dollars stashed away in Swiss bank accounts. Um, he's somebody who's presiding over the House as they're all getting up one by one, all of them accused of corruption and saying, we must remove the president for corruption. And amazingly, Bilmer herself is one of the few people not accused of any kind of bribery or personal corruption or kickbacks or anything to be enriched. What's going on is pretty simple. Her party, the, the, the Workers' Party, or the PT, has won four straight national elections, going all the way back to Lula, who was wildly popular, who was first elected in 2006 and then re-elected in 2000, in 2000 and then re-elected in 2006. The plutocrats in Brazil, the rich in Brazil, and long-hated PT have not been able to defeat them at the ballot box. Um, and so this is their big chance with the economy tanking, with this crisis proliferating, um, with people really upset with the government and the political class. This is their big chance to finally get rid of PT, which they cannot win in an election. And so they're using these anti-democratic means to do it. It's incredibly blatant what's taking place. Do you think, because even her supporters, certainly of course, she tried predecessor as star, thought this was a step forward, that she was trying to shield him from any criminal pro uh, and obviously help her in some way. Some have said she resigned, even though she may not be impeachable, or these things that she's accused of don't rise to the level of impeachable offenses. 
Do you think that she should resign? Will she be forced to resign? I don't think she, I mean, no, I think she will be forced to resign. She's been very clear that she won't. This is a woman who was put into prison as a dissident during the dictatorship and who was tortured. Um, she's a very strong and vocal woman um, who has been through a lot in her life. Um, and remember, the election in Brazil was only 18 months ago. It was at the end of 2014. She won that election with 54 million votes. Um, it is true that she's, up, she's made a lot of missteps. Um, that, that effort to get Lula into the government, um, which is really a survival, last minute survival, get radical charisma and a lot of political skill that she lacks Lula into government to try and save her was not a, didn't have a very good look. Um, but at the same time, you cannot go around, if you wanna have a mature democracy, a mature stable democracy, and remove democratically elected leaders who just won a major election 18 months earlier because they're unpopular or because they're not managing the economy well. That is a recipe for some really dangerous things when you start tinkering with the mechanics of democracy, especially in a country like Brazil, which has a very fragile and a very young democracy. They came out of dictatorship only in 85, and it's really disturbing to watch them trifling with democracy this way. So uh, we talked about how the whole system is full of political scandals and corruption. And you've also admitted that her party is sort of deep corrupt and awash in its own sort of you know criminal wrongdoings, even though she's not, not touched. So I wonder, you know, what you you know, what's the way out of that? But particularly in like what this professor at um, the Sao Paulo University has told the New York about what's going on now. It's putting a very large bullet in Brazilian democracy says on any moment that we have a highly unpopular president, there'll be pressure to start a different process. Right. I mean, it's interesting. Um, I interviewed um, the former president, Lula, last week in, in Sao Paulo. He admitted two things to me in that interview. He said, number one, it's true that his party, the PT party, which is Dilma's party as well, has a very serious problem with corruption, just like most of the other parties. And then number two, there's there's this major investigation that's called Lava Jato or, or Car Wash in English, in which these really aggressive young prosecutors have asserted judicial independence and have been aggressively putting people in prison, the richest people in Brazil, the most politically powerful people in Brazil. The solution is to let that investigation unfold and let the people who are guilty be put in prison. The concern is that their intention with, with teaching Dilma say to the country, look, we got rid of the corruption problem. The media pressure, the public pressure, they hope will dissipate. Now that there's this catharsis over impeachment and that this investigation and all of these truly corrupt politicians will be protected. Um, so the solution to answer your question is to let this investigation unfold, take everybody who's corrupt, all of the opposition parties and MP, of which there are many, and uh, subject them to the rule of law and to accountability and put them in prison, as was going to happen prior to the impeachment of Dilma. An incredible story. Well, thanks for joining us from Rio de Janeiro tonight. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Oh, I, I like this report, and it is important because it demonstrates a view from foreign press, which is not the view from Brazilian press. We don't see these informations in Brazilian press during impeachment process. Why not? <laughs> well, uh, because uh, media um, doesn't like a uh, workers' party. And, and then uh, they don't, they, um, the media in Brazil, Brazilian media support the impeachment, supported the impeachment, the impeachment process. Move on. Um, now about journalistic narratives. And what are the general aspects of journalistic narratives? So bias, no reconstruction of reality from fragmented reports and biased language, uh, points of view treated as the only version, and narrative atoms, themes and repertoires that were usually present in daily news, and reports explore facts 
to create reality effects and the staging to create emotional effects. And now to explain how journalistic narratives work, I'll show you some examples comparing Brazilian media and foreign media. And first, but first I want to show you uh, Jornal Nacional, JN, uh, meaning nationwide night news from Global Network. Um, it is the most important TV night news in Brazil. And JN performed an important role throughout Dilma Rousseff's impeachment, as well as in the recent elections. Um, since I started my research, I have analyzed about 700 daily editions of Jornal Nacional. My study does not only evaluate the objective elements, duration of the subjects, for example, and I also pay attention to, to what is said, how it is said, by whom it is said. And in JN Daily News, we can observe some recurrent elements that create a narrative standard. Uh, first, manufactured consent, alignment between power instance, silencing as editorial policy. So now some examples to understand how narrative works in JN. Um, in 2014, according to United Nations, Brazil had left the world hunger map, reducing the historical poverty. This is the image from JN. But despite of this, Jornal Nacional dedicated only 38 seconds to this issue. At the same edition, news about the weather had one minute. Um, this is an, an example of how silencing uh, a discursive strategy, silencing as a editorial political, worse editorial policy, sorry, works on news. So can you help explain though, why would silencing happen for such good news? Wouldn't good news like leaving the, the world hunger map, wouldn't that be something to celebrate? And so why was this particular issue silenced? Uh, because um, uh, silencing, how silencing work. Um, Jornal Nacional uh, dedicated a, um, a small time to this issue. And uh, this issue uh, uh, does not the, the, the um, a long time Okay, uh, this news about the weather had one minute. And um, it's, a, um, it's a, a very important issue to Brazil. And Jornal Nacional dedicated um, a small time to this issue. One moment, one moment, Renee. I have, I have help, what? Oh, okay, why? Uh, because this issue, this issue is not interesting because uh, it, it, um, it, it poderia, please help me. <laughs> it poderia um, uh, ser um, uma, isso ocorreu uh, during Dilma Rousseff's government. You see, and um, it it isso ocorreu em 2014. E I have <laughs> I have a translator with me so they, to help so they, me. So they didn't want to give credit to Dilma for this good news. So instead of sharing the good news, they just minimized yes, the yes, good news. Yes, yes, yes. This is the case uh, because this uh, it's a uh, um, um, a good good news to Duma's government. So it was a political reason. Yeah. yeah. The, the media yeah. outlet had a political bias and yeah. they did not want to in any way make the government look like they were doing a good job 
exactly yeah yeah it is wow so, <laughs> can you understand sorry yeah got okay. it okay so move on so um uh you can see an image to illustrate corruption and every night jane starts an image like this one to reflect means about corruption and the image of a sewer pipe from which money flows and notice just to illustrate the news about the workers party the party Dilma Rousseff and Lula belong to uh, the image is in red the color of the workers party so every night okay this image another example and you see a sewer pipe illustrating news about Lula okay So an example, uh, alignment between power instances. Um, in, you can see an image in Joma and Lula, okay? And in 2015, Judge Sergio Moro disclosed an audio recording of a conversation between Dilma and Lula, which was illegal since Dilma was the president. He sent a recording for JN to broadcast it with exclusive rights. Okay, so move on. And now, how JN narrative works. Um, important aspects in JN news day by day during impeachment process. Uh, negative framework, Repertoires use day by day corruption and economic crisis. Silencing uh, emotion news and semantic fields. Um, now we are going to 2018 to see the relation between JN narratives and Bolsonaro, Brazil's newly elected president. Okay, well, um, first we will see how foreign press presents Bolsonaro. Who is Bolsonaro? According to foreign press, I'd like to show you an example from the New York Times. Can you see this statement? Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, an example from Guardian. The Economist, New York Times again, opinion. Um, and finally, I'd like to show you a video from the Guardian with Bolsonaro's statements. Eu sou favorável à tortura, tu sabe disso. Nós não, o povo, a sociedade brasileira não gosta de, de homossexual. Cultura é diferente da nossa. Agora nós estamos, nós estamos preparados ainda no Brasil, porque nem um pai, nem você, nem eu, tem orgulho de ter um filho gay. Com orgulho, Ai, prazer, fazer. Desculpe. Claro que o filho começa a ficar meio assim, meio gayzinho, leva um couro, ele muda completamente. Tá certo? Se seu filho se apaixonasse por uma negra, o que você faria? Ô, Preta, eu não vou discutir por promiscuidade com quem quer que seja. Ai, ai. Os povos de risco e meus filhos foram muito bem educados. Eu fui no quilombo e eu dou nada para isso. Eu acho o descendente mais leve lá, pesava sete arrocas. Não fazem nada. Eu acho que nem para procuradores serve mais. Jamais eu 
Um, and they never mention these statements. Okay. Um, and now we can see how JN has established a humanized image of Bolsonaro despite his statements. Um, this is an exclusive interview to the end um, after he left the hospital. Okay, uh, he seems to be a very good person. He sounds like a very good candidate. And JN dedicated a long time to him. And after Bolsonaro's accident, I mean, when he was stabbed during a demonstration, JN began to overexpose his health condition and never mentioned these, uh, his statements. What kind of discursive strategies were used in this process? Uh, framework is extremely positive and silence about Bolsonaro's statements. Uh, so, my point is, uh, Brazilian media has ignored Bolsonaro's statements. They have never questioned how sexist, racist, homophobic, or misogynist he is. Uh, Bolsonaro was treated as a normal candidate all the time, but in fact he isn't. And his campaign was based on spreading disinformation through different media vehicles, mainly those from Global Corporation Network and WhatsApp. So, media literacy in Brazil. And to finish, I would like to say that accessing the basis of journalistic narratives is essential to understanding the role of media in Brazil, because media plays a key role in Brazil's political, economic, and social scenarios. In the study of discursive moments, the journalistic narrative constructed by JN has used specific discursive strategies in order to frame daily news. Because of media's great power in Brazil, media literacy is a fundamental tool. In our country, voting is compulsory, is starting at a very early age, 16. Uh, disinformation operates in a large scale, and many Brazilian people are functional illiterate. In such scenery, media literacy should be regarded as a civil right in the form of government initiative to foster media literacy education. Despite this scenery, there is no systematic use of media literacy in Brazil, unfortunately. And thank you so much for, you, for your attention, my contacts. Wow, thank you, that's... And I have written many articles about this topic. So I would like to share some of them uh, with you, but unfortunately they are in Portuguese. <laughs> and if someone is interested, they can translate. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Eliara. So I'm hoping that uh, people have comments or questions now. Who wants to start us off? Okay. And you need to unmute yourself because I muted all the participants. Walter, so if you want to. Walter, I see your hand is raised. Where am I? Oh, I don't know. Ye Can you Walter, hear? Did you, you have a comment or a question or were you just stretching? So, so, so I have a, I have a, I have a comment or question. So one of the things that you, it looked like you did methodologically was you compared the Brazilian press to the foreign press in order to identify the bias. You, there are some strengths and limitations to doing that. 
what what led you to use that strategy of comparing the foreign press to the Brazilian national press in order to identify this particular kind of bias? Why did you do that? Because the foreign press is biased too, yeah. right? Okay. <laughs> I have a, I have a, I have a, someone to help me, okay? Okay. Okay, one moment. Okay. Not in common, not bias in common, uh, because uh, during uh, the impeachment process, um, foreign media uh, had a, a, a good work for us uh, because foreign media uh, explores <coughs> aspects that Brazilian media doesn't. And um, uh, for example, uh, Brazilian uh, uh, foreign media uh, discuss about um, another corruption that were investigating Dilma Rousseff. And here in Brazil, uh, Brazilian media never mentioned this, this, uh, this point. Wow. So is, is, it, um, is it possible for Brazilian uh, uh, families in their homes to get access to foreign news or no? No, 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 no. Uh -huh. uh, no, because um, uh, we have a... Um, uh, in Brazil, we have a terrible internet, and it's not. Um, uh, it's only only. Um, how can I say open TV? Yeah, uh, open it's, TV. It's only yeah. open TV television, and JN has a. It's the the most powerful. Uh, I. Uh, I'm I'm Brazilian too. I, I am I am from <laughs> I, am, I am I am from Rio Grande do Sul. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I enjoyed very much your research. Uh, Thank you. Uh, then uh, with the, the result of elections, it, it was more important this this research because it's it's a process that uh, is continuing. Perhaps we are yeah. really. We are really living a cup, uh, like uh, the, uh, Dilma said uh, in the in the new in CNN. Uh, uh, for me, it's, uh, I, I like very much because you began with demonstrations in 2013, yeah. Yeah. and I think uh, at this moment is it was very important because uh, could be the concentration of uh, workers' party, because yeah. uh, it, it's going to have the uh, World Football World Cup in Brazil, and the, the Olympic, uh, Olympic Games, yeah. and, and then a lot of forces uh, go uh, against uh, the, the government, like the government is doing something very wrong with the uh, foot, 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 uh, World Cup and the Olympiades, and all demonstrations against uh, the government. That uh, I think it, it's very interesting to investigate this process, like how the uh, public opinion in Brazil change in this, the, these years, and we are living now this situation very it's very difficult to understand the, and comprehend uh, but uh, it's very important for the, the democracy in brazil we, we we understand how to have better communication because uh, i think really we are living a, a strong problem of communication in brazil yeah here uh, because here uh, brazilian media is very concentrated yeah uh, so we can um, uh, we don't have a pluralism, uh, and uh, uh, just only six or seven, six families control everything. We we watch, we listen, we read in. So it's it's terrible. It's a, a terrible. So that was very helpful to me because media consolidation plus this hinge moment 
this anti-government demonstration that seemed to have been the impetus to sort of flip public opinion, right? And so once the public opinion is emphasizes anti-government, then everyone in government is, is tainted. What confuses me though, is if the political leaders who were calling for her impeachment were themselves tainted by corruption, on what grounds would they have any credibility and didn't the media document their lack of their corruption? One moment, Renee. Oh, okay. Um, yes. And uh, this is the role of media uh, because um, um, media uh, never, never mentioned um, um, uh, this, this, this another corrupt. Nunca falou sobre esses corruptos. That never mentioned that those people. That, that those political um, that were judged were against Dilma were against. With oh, so that's where the silencing happened. They didn't let the public yeah. know. Oh, yeah, so yeah, yeah, these guys exactly. are even more corrupt than exactly. Dilma. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Unbelievable. Yeah, we here in Brazil, we we just uh, we just uh, uh, see and and talk about uh, this topic, this another corruptions um, by by view from foreign media, not media. Brazilian media doesn't mention this. Never. Always, uh, always after the impeachment. <laughs> Just only after the impeachment, yeah. But uh, yeah. Hello. Other comments and questions. Uh, I would like to to speak about uh, the the situation we are living now with the with the election of Bolsonaro, uh, because. Uh, it seems like uh, between journalists like me, uh, we, we, we didn't believe he is going to be elected, but uh, it, it, he was elected. And uh, I think uh, I, I would like to understand now the, the, the position of mainstream, because uh, the government of Bolsonaro began with fights against uh, uh, Folha de São Paulo, yeah. the, 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 the main newspapers in São Paulo, and against uh, uh, Global Network. And uh, I, 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 for, it's very, uh, uh, it, it, it's important to, to know how the, uh, uh, these vehicles I go, are going to react uh, and uh, how Bolsonaro is going to, to react. Uh, perhaps we are going to do another impeachment like uh, in the past uh, happened with a caller, which, he, which he, uh, have uh, to, uh, a strong campaign of the global network against him. <laughs> I, uh, perhaps uh, we don't know if we are going to have an agreement between these these interesting or a new impeachment. Okay. Uh, wow! Uh, so it's a very tender moment at this process. As you wonder, will this something will another impeachment happen in the future? Thank you for sharing, Gilmar. In the chat room is a really interesting conversation, and Christiane, I would love you to. Uh, 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 talk to us uh, uh, about this. Pam asked, are the churches involved in the spread of disinformation and biased information? And Christian, you had something to say about that. Do you want to help us understand that? Hi, everybody. Um, we have a very, we have now a very dangerous situations in Brazil, situation in Brazil because all of the governments of Lula and Dilma uh, contributed to lots of rights to LGBT people, 
to black people, women, children and adolescents. So what happened now is that these um, radical religions like neo-pentecostais, I'm not sure if this word uh, exists in English, it's a kind of radical evangelic churches and I'm, um, I don't consider that they are really churches, but uh, kind of anything else to, <laughs> to take money from, from poor people and well, people that don't have so, they're not, they don't have so much uh, education. Um, imagine what they want to do now. They want uh, uh, the students record teachers at schools. Yeah. Can you imagine a teacher talking about uh, slavery or talking about history and some students recorded this teacher and sending these images to the president of Republic or the Ministry of Education telling that these teachers are from communists or these teachers are whatever. We are still living now the situation. So this is really bad. So teachers are afraid to share their political views in, in any way, right? This is yes, of... yes. Now it's, re now it's really complicated. Uh, we have teachers in universities uh, that uh, are calling to go to the police to explain why they are talking about this some issue, some specific issue, for example, about dictatorial issue. Uh, one of the ministers, I, I'm not sure if it was the new minister of education, um, told that maybe the books have to be changed because the history has to have a new, um, a new way of being. Oh, these it's completely crazy. It's history. completely crazy. Uh, so, so George asks another really great, thank you for sharing that. That is fascinating and chilling right and we are definitely seeing a chilling effect here in the u.s as social studies teachers in the u.s are afraid to talk about uh trump and there are uh, repercussions that can happen in some communities george asks a really good question in the back channel he asks is the judicial system in are the courts independent or also controlled so can you uh can you help us understand in terms of the the uh, political uh, situation of what's the role of the judiciary? Oh my God! What's sorry? I... Are the courts independent or controlled? George asks. Um, like judges? Are judges influenced by the political process, or do they stand outside the political process? Oh my God! The court is. <laughs> I think the court is a part of the coup because you see now uh, Sergio Moro is a new minister. Uh, he was the judge uh, that uh, um, sent the the recording, huh? recording from Lula and Dilma to uh, and sent to JN. So now he is a minister from Bolsonaro. Um, I think part of the court are um, a part of the coup, I think. So, so in the last few minutes, we have definitely people in the back channel wanting to ask about, so what's the possibility for media literacy in Brazil? And we'd love to hear all the Brazilians who are in the chat room to chime in with adding your point of view on this. It sounds to me like it might be impossible to do media literacy in such a context, but maybe I am wrong. Vera, Gilmar, Christian, Eliara, what are your thoughts about the future for media literacy in Brazil in the, under the current political environment? I don't think media literacy now, it will be possible. I think um, in Lula, for example, we had a very interesting uh, policy uh, called Mais Educação, or plus education, yeah. and uh, we had a kind of uh, media literacy, let me see, not so, so big, because uh, imagine, it, we only in public school, we have 200,000 public schools in Brazil. So it's really difficult 
create a political solution to all of them in some, in some years. We really need time to do this in a correct way. So Lula did this with Haddad when Haddad uh, was a Ministry of Education. Yeah. So Haddad that was against Bolsonaro. I, I don't know if you remember this. Haddad was the other candidate and he was a very, very good Ministry of Education. And yes, we had a kind of, not so much, but a kind of media literacy programs. Now, I really think it's impossible. Or if they decided to do this, will be a kind of bias at media education, media literacy. <laughs> and it will be much worse than we can imagine. Because if we have uh, people in the power that think so so bad about democracy, so bad about history, so bad about women, women rights and black people and LGBT. Can you imagine how we have, can we have media literacy now? I think it's really necessary. It's urgent for everybody in Brazil, but maybe we had to do this. We have to do this by uh, some ONGO, NGOs, organizations, or some foundations, or but for the government, I really think it's impossible. Wow, thanks for sharing. Other thoughts on that? I would really, uh, Walter shared like in the chat. So Walter, I would love to hear your thoughts and also Vera, because we didn't hear from you. What are your reflection from all the discussion? Well, uh, I see some experience in private schools, some very special uh, private schools only but it's just the beginning, beginning, and that's one, one camp I would like to work on. That's why I'm studying, I'm following some authors, and like Rennie Hobbs, for instance, like you, and uh, I think it is very, very urgent, to have, as we, we have already said, and uh, I believe that it's possible, that it is possible not in the public uh, schools. I'm not sure about it, but private schools, yes, for sure. Wow, Vera, th thank you very much for sharing. It's true that uh, the working in the private schools does create much more opportunity for uh, elite students, but this is also gives you some some uh, freedom to explore this. One thing I would love to invite the Brazilians who are on this call is that the examples of propaganda that you find in the news or on your social media post or on YouTube, we would be delighted if you would share it to the Mind Over Media uh, uh, collection that is a uh, curated gallery of uh, contemporary propaganda from all over the world. Right now we have a couple of Lula, we have that couple of Lula and anti-Lula uh, posters. We have a couple of things from Dilma's impeachment, but I'd love to put examples up so that, the, so that we can begin to talk more um, in a more sophisticated way about the nature of this kind of propaganda mm -hmm. that's being used against uh, Brazilian people. Uh, would, you, would you be interested in this kind of propaganda, even uh, being Portuguese. No yes, problem. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I would love it to be in Portuguese because our website is translated. It's it's trans it's translated okay. into multiple okay. languages, and we could use we okay. could use numbers in Portuguese for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, you talk also. You could talk about you would talk about uh, sponsored content, for instance. Any kind of of problems <laughs> it will be interesting for you. Of course. Il Ilara, tonight what was interesting is that you helped us understand the power of silencing. And I feel, feel like in, in reflecting on the last uh, hour, for me that was the big insight, is to, through the comparison between the national press and the foreign press, to notice the omissions. And in media literacy, we say that helping people to recognize how to notice what's missing is a really important uh, media literacy competency. Um, so, I, I, oh yeah, I, I have one question. The, the she said the, the I, my apologies. I don't know the name of the person that she said 
the foreign press is not available there. But how did she get the foreign press? Good question. Yeah. <laughs> oh, foreign press. Um, foreign press are not available for um, a lot of people. Okay, yeah. but. Um, at university, we have access. I have access. Some oh. some people have access, but not all the people oh. in Brazil. So, yes. so university faculty and other people who are studying, you are studying journalism. You have yeah. access to the foreign press, but a typical person would not. Wow. Okay, that was really fascinating. Um, so Yanti, thank you for organizing this meeting. I think we have another event coming up next Monday we want to tell you about, is that right? Yes, it's going to be What's in the morning. Yes, so 9 a.m. Eastern Time, the Media Club, the monthly Media Club for December. Uh, and we're going to post later on our series of webinars for um, the next year. We're going to have uh, a webinar in January with Project Look Sharp that we're really looking forward to. Wonderful. And next Monday, we're talking about the very famous book by Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, so that's a really interesting book about the sort of psychology of uh, system one and system two thinking about media literacy it might involve like slowing down some of our cognitive processes to go to be more uh, systematic and logical. So I hope you can join us next week for that event. Uh, let's give uh, Eliara a big round of applause for uh, helping us understand today. Uh, for many mistakes, okay? Thank you. <laughs> uh, so uh, Vera, Walter, George, Brian, Christian, Pam, Gilmar, Yanti, uh, Frank, thank you for, and others of you who are, might be watching the, this recording, thank you for joining us at the Media Education Lab. We'll hope to see you next Monday, December 10th at 9 a.m. Eastern for another session. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you.